Welcome back to another episode of Heaven and Healing Podcast. I'm Angela, and today we're going to be talking about the dangers of self-help culture. So um, I'm going to first ask if you haven't already to please subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, whichever platform you listen or watch. Um, And please, please, please give the podcast a five-star review and a written review, okay? It's really, really helpful for getting this into more people's ears. Um, and it would just mean a lot to me. If you enjoy the episode, definitely take a screenshot of you listening or watching, post it to your Instagram story and tag me so that I can see it, share it, and thank you personally. I will leave my Instagram handle in the show notes so you can check that out when you're finished. Um, I want to start with this episode particularly by stating what it is not, okay? Because I know a lot of people right off the bat aren't going to like the title of this and may not necessarily like the message, but honestly, I'm not here to be liked. So (laughs) Jesus himself was crucified, right? Um, But regardless, I wanted to address what the triggers of this episode very well could be for people listening so that the truth of this message, so that the premise of this message is not lost in any emotional response that you may have to the title, to anything that may be stated, okay? So let's just address what it's not. I'm not bashing the authors of any of the books that I will mention. I'm not bashing any author of any self-help book, nor am I saying that they are bad people. You know, self-help authors, and I speak from experience because I started and never finished like three self-help books in my early 20s. Um, Self-help authors They are just people that want to do better and be better and feel better, which is why they attract people that want to do better and be better and feel better to read their books, right? So I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm not putting down anyone who seeks out help, okay? That's not what this is about. I'm not saying don't help yourself. I'm saying there's dangers to the self-help culture, to the self-help movement, but I'm not promoting, you know anyone not seek out therapy, anyone not seek out counseling, anyone not seek out AA, I am not saying any of those things, okay? So this isn't about putting down therapy or anything like that. I'm not saying to no longer take care of yourself or to not value your well-being, okay? That is definitely not the message here. And I'm not promoting any shame. I'm not promoting any condemnation on anybody. Um, for what you may do or what they may do at this time. And then finally, I am not discrediting the truth that there are valuable lessons within these books and within this movement, right? There's always going to be truth in things. That's what draws us to them, right? So I said this with New Age practice as well, that there's just enough truth to reel us in and then there's just enough deception to keep us there. So this is a very similar kind of slippery slope that we are sliding on with the self-help culture. So again, I'm not discrediting that there are valuable lessons. There are 100% good lessons in these books, but we do have to use discernment and take things with a grain of salt and know what we know about scripture and about God and about sanctification when entering the realm of self-help, okay? So this episode is inspired because, you know, I've been thinking a lot recently about how I came into New Age in the first place. And I feel like a big component of that that I often don't even recognize in of myself is the self-help movement. That's kind of where it all started because I say that the new age practices developed from when my grandmom died, right? But my yearning to be a better person, my yearning to grow, that has been within me since I was a child that I just wanna be better, I just wanna do better, I just wanna do more kind of feeling, kind of hunger, right? That has always been in me. So that was there even before my grandmom died. So I was into personal development even before that time, okay? Even before I was into the new age. Now, I recently received a text message from someone that I worked with. He sent me a picture of a book he was reading and I took a screenshot of it. It's called Claim Your Power, a 40-day journey to dissolve the hidden trauma that's kept you stuck and finally thrive in your life's unique purpose. So when I saw that, 
I want it to honestly respond to be a little facetious and say, hey, you have no power, go read your Bible. <laughs> I didn't, but that was the first thought that came to mind. And it was really interesting to observe because if I had, if, if particularly this is a male that I'm speaking to, if a male had sent me that text um, even two years ago that he's reading a book called Claim Your Power, I would have been all over that. I've been, I would have thought, wow, what an integrated man, you know? Wow, someone who wants to grow, wants to do better for himself, wants to really harness his divine masculinity and be the best version of himself that he can be for himself. Like, wow, that's that's incredible. I would have loved that. But when I, he sent me that picture, my first thought really was, you have no power, go read your Bible. It's like Kanye, right? Go find God. Um, <laughs> talk to me when you find God. So yeah, and it just got me thinking about that. Even the title alone, it's written in big letters, claim your power, a 40 day journey to dissolve the hidden trauma that's kept you stuck. Like it's, it's like this instant gratification title that just like swoops you in like, oh, I can heal lifelong trauma in 40 days. Sign me up, right? And it got me just really thinking about how this book title, I know nothing about the book, nothing about the author, I will say that, and so many other books like it, all these self-help books, it's all instant gratification, it's all about the power within, right? And it's all capitalizing on the human experience of desperately trying to fill a void. And when you think of it in that way, it's it's extremely, it's vulturous, it's messed up, Right? it's it's an entire subculture that completely feeds on pain it feeds on your pain on your suffering on the god void that we all have really because that hunger that we all have that was put there by him for him to feed us our daily bread there's no there's no mistake you know we all have this innate hunger within us that leads us to books like claim your power heal your trauma in 40 days okay books like nothing changes until you do that I have sitting next to me books like the four gifts of anxiety books like you can heal your life by Louise Hay that hunger leads us to these kinds of things when we don't know better. So that's really what the premise of this episode is. It's just when you know better, you can do better, right? So I wanted to highlight the dangers of self-help culture. I brought three of my, if you're watching, you can see, I, I brought three of my former favorite self-help books with me. And this is only... I mean, not even a tenth of what my collection was. I did get rid of a lot of more of like the more spirituality based books, like the four agreements and things like that when I did my new age purge and got rid of all these things. But I, I do have a lot of books on my bookshelf downstairs still. And these are some of the ones that I loved. I absolutely loved. And so I wanted to use some examples from these books um, that I'll be getting into in a moment. So... My whole personal experience very briefly with self-help was, like I said, I've always been into the personal development movement of wanting to be better, but I actually joined a um, an MLM a couple years ago. And when I say a couple years, I mean like seven or eight at this point. Wow, uh, that's crazy. And it was all about health and wellness. It was about helping people lose weight, feel better, all good things, right? Because I had lost 120 pounds and I wanted to help people feel better. So I got on board with the supplementation company because another thing, right? Didn't know any better. Um, and I helped a lot of people. I had great intentions with it. But the thing with MLMs, if you've ever been in one, if you follow anyone on Instagram in one, you see the kind of culture that it breeds. It's all, it's all boss babe culture. It's all, you know manifest your reality, life by design, um, create the life that you deserve, right? Like abundance is your birthright. It's all that kind of stuff that puts in your brain like you are more than you realize, like you are worth so much more than you realize. And it's all that personal development lifestyle. And so when I was entrenched in that, I was being encouraged to read books that were centered around this. I also had another a job that um, I worked at a cafe at the time and the owner was 
very much into personal development. I was very much into personal development. We had a book club that I started at this cafe in my early 20s alongside doing the health coaching. And it was all personal development. I was just so into it. I just, I felt like I finally tapped into the answer to life, right? Oh, my own power, my own grit, my own efforts, my own discipline. If I can just do this, if I can just do this and keep going with this, then I will, I'll, I'll figure out life. I'll, I'll do whatever I want. It'll, and I can help other people do that too. I just need to help them see the power that they have. So I have to get them reading these books. I have to get them immersed in this culture with me. I have to get them saying the affirmations. I have to get them committing to the waking up at 8 a.m. every day, making the bed first thing in the morning, right? All these little practices that we do with self-help where, and you know, the definition of self-help is literally, I have it defined right here. So the definition of self-help is the use of one's own efforts and resources to achieve things without relying on others, okay? So that was my mojo. That was my life's purpose, I thought. And that was very huge for me in my early 20s. And that is the, that is the kind of um, sliding board that just led me into new age spirituality, that led me into witchcraft, that led me into astrology, because it all went hand in hand, right? And it was something I didn't even realize, honestly, until after I was saved. I never really put two and two together that all the self-help books, all the personal development books, all the, you know, watching Tony Robbins on YouTube, watching Gary Vaynerchuk on YouTube, it led me to watching tarot card readings on YouTube, buying tarot cards, like it was a sliding board. And that's the thing, you don't realize it because the thing with self-help, right? The use of one's own efforts and resources to achieve things without relying on others, that is the equation of self plus self equals more self. So I was continually grasping for more of me, continually reaching for more of me. So I kept grabbing more books to learn more about myself, to unleash more of my power. That power, there's a very thin line between the word power and magic, right? So it's releasing my power, releasing my magic. What does magic mean? So now I'm entrenched in the spirituality aspect of the personal development movement. Do you see how blurred that line is and how easy it is to cross over? And I'm sure a lot of you listening have a similar testimony with that. So it's not that there's necessarily anything inherently wrong with reading books like this. It's where they lead. It's the underlying messages within them that get programmed subconsciously into our minds that we then operate from and believe to be true so then we don't seek out what actually is, okay? So I'm getting ahead of myself. The issue, you know, with self-help ultimately gave the definition. Like I said, it's, it's basically using your own personal power with habitual habits, practices, you know, using affirmations, etc., to transform the self into someone of character. And that can be within the realm of your happiness, you know, whether it's your mental health, money, love, physical health and well-being, you know, business, what have you, anything, okay, can fall under that criteria or under that umbrella of self-care. Now, the issue with it, okay, there's three things I want to unpack, one, the issue with self-help culture is that it promotes the idea that we are good people inherently, that we are inherently good, that we are inherently love, okay? Two, it capitulates a lifestyle in which the self is centered. Self-help. <laughs> it can't capitulate anything but that, right? And then the third issue is this higher self narrative that either waters down God, completely blasphemous, or 
eliminates him altogether. Okay. So now we'll unpack those three. And I'm going to start by using an example from Louise Hayes' book, You Can Heal Your Life, which came up on my Facebook last week um, in my memories from like five years ago where I posted a picture of myself reading it on my bed. And I said in that um, picture, everyone needs to read this book. <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> um, and again, not bashing Louise Hay. She was a loving woman. She just was not, not biblical at all. So, you know, who knows? Um, page 109 of this book, it says, it is our natural birthright. Excuse me. It is our natural birthright to go from success to success all our life. Wow. Like that is, that is an incredibly self-righteous thing to say. And you know, what's funny is that I have this highlighted with a heart next to it. It is natural, it is our natural birthright to go from success to success all our life. If we are not doing that, either we are not in tune with our innate capabilities, or we do not believe that it is true for us, or we do not recognize our own success. We, 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 my, 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 self, self, self. Natural birthright to go from success to success. Another example is from the book, Nothing Changes Until You Do, and on page 15, just the chapter name. Chapter four. Remember that you're valuable just because you're you. That's literally the name of the chapter. Remember that you're valuable just because you're you. So it's your natural birthright to have success and you're valuable just because you're you. Two brief examples from self-help books. Now, the thing with that and with self-help culture, self-help books in general, is that it says you are enough because you're you, that you are inherently good, that you are worthy, that you are whole, that you are complete, that you are perfect, that you're just trying to get back to your higher self and blah, 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 right? So you're inherently good. And that if you just try harder, right, if you just do more, you will be a better person in any aspect that you are seeking. Any of those aforementioned themes that we just talked about, you know, health, wealth, business, body, relationships, if you just try harder, do more, tap into that power, if you tap into your enoughness, right, you will be a better person in any aspect you're seeking. So self-help books say you are better than you realize and greater than your adversity. Scripture says you are worse than you realize, but God's grace is greater than your sin. Okay, huge difference huge massive difference self-help books say you are greater than you realize and better than your adversity the gospel says you are worse than you realize but god's grace is greater than your sin okay so with self-help culture it's entirely unbiblical and as followers of christ that's not the, that's not the path okay what jesus says goes that's it, right? So essentially, all this self-help paints a picture of you as this, this sinless person because you're enough, right? It's okay if you make mistakes because you're, you're enough. You're worthy. It's your birthright to have success throughout your entire life. It's your birthright. You, aren't, you, you may have flaws, but you're enough. You can work through those flaws, right? A lot of these books urge you to just forgive yourself. Louise Hay has a lot of practices on self-forgiveness. Forgive yourself, you know. You made mistakes, but that's when, you know, you were unintegrated, X, Y, Z. Now you're doing the work. Now you're integrated. Forgive yourself for your past. Be your own sanctifier. That's what that message is saying. It's saying be your own savior, Okay, but the thing is, grace does not come from the self. John 1, 19, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. Grace and truth come by Jesus Christ. 
Your grace does not come from yourself. How can you be both the problem and the solution? How can self be both the problem and the solution? How? How does that even logistically make sense? You know, a lot of people that want to talk about logic have these arbitrary ideas. Oh, self is problem, self is also solution. Logically, doesn't make sense. Okay, we are sinners. That logically makes sense when you look at the world around you. We are in a fallen world. Do you need evidence? Step out your front door and look around. We are sinners. We cannot be our own solution. Look what happens when we try to do things for ourselves. Turn on the news. Walk out the front door. Go to your grocery store. Talk to somebody on the street. That's the, that is the result of being your own solution. More brokenness in that world. Because the world is broken, it is fallen, and grace does not come from the self. We are sinners, for all have, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23 All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All. A-L-L. Everybody. Romans 3.10, as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. Not one. Not one. The best person on this earth, no one righteous. So we do not have the authority to self-help. We do not have the authority to be our own salvation when we ourselves are the problem. And look, I'm not saying whatever happened to you in your life was your fault, right? Not, you know, things happen, you know, trauma happens, people get hurt, people do messed up things. Not saying any of that's your fault. I'm saying it's the nature of humanity is sin, the very nature of humanity is sin. So the pain and suffering that was inflicted upon you and my heart goes out to you, that came from the result of sin. We are in a sinful world. So these self-help books come and say, no, you it, it's your birthright to have success. It's your birthright to have success. You know, people people are lying to us on television every day, but it's your birthright to have success because you're enough, you're valuable. You're valuable. You're whole. No, grace does not come from the self. Okay? But these books will really put it in your mind that this idea of like a higher self. Okay? And I want to go into this book, The Four Gifts of Anxiety, which I've read three or four times. Um, but uh, I don't even need to say the author's name. Let's go to page 76. Okay. So page 76 here, right? This is the four gifts of anxiety. This book is all about taking your anxiety and again, just like everything else, using your using it for your own power. Taking your problem and creating your solution out of it. Using, using your anxiety as a gift, essentially, instead of taking it to the Lord, which is what scripture tells us to do. Anyway, here in the book it says, um, your higher self is the part of you that is whole and complete. It is the part of you that says, I am already enough. Many of us never learned what a higher self was, never mind how to connect to it. So then it just goes on to explain how to connect to your higher self and that it's within all of us. And it's just something that we need to experience. Um, so again, that this idea of the higher self, right? It Compituates the lifestyle or the focus where the self is centered. And you know what this is, essentially? It's a form of idolatry. And that's a huge danger in it. It's like the biggest of all, really. Because let's think to Exodus 32, right? Um, where they are waiting at the, the Israelites are waiting at the bottom of the mountain for Moses to come down with the law. You know, this is where it's like 13 chapters or something where God is giving Moses the commandments. And so the Israelites get 
they get tired of waiting for Moses. And so they get with Aaron and he forges the gold and whatever, and they make the golden calf. I completely butchered that story, but if you know the story, you know it. If you don't, it's Exodus. And you can go to chapter 32 specifically, where we see kind of God's wrath about, he calls them corrupt. When they make the golden calf and they start to worship that, this is his response to idolatry. He hates it. It's one of the Ten Commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me. No other gods, including yourself. And so we can use the golden calf as this an example of idolatry. He calls it, he calls it corrupt, right? Is that not what we're doing when we are self-help? When we are self-helping? <laughs> is that not a form of self-worship? And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased. And he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Okay? So here, Jesus speaking to the apostles in Matthew 23, saying that whoever exalts himself is, is a base, is, is an abomination to me. Why are you exalting yourself? But he that humbles himself, I will exalt him. So do you see how that works? It's not our job or our birthright, as Louise Hay says, to exalt ourselves. It's God's job to exalt us as we humble ourselves before his feet, as we lay our life down for him. So all this self-idolatry, it's ultimately, the goal of it is to better the self or identify the self for the self. But that's not what sanctification is or growth in godliness is all about. We think that, you know, without God, we think that discipline will get us there. We think that good works will get us there. Being a good person, doing the quote unquote right thing, which again, who determines right or wrong if you don't have God, right? Yourself? Oh, more self-worship. So we think that if we do the right thing, if we are disciplined, if we have all our ducks in a row, if we take great care of ourselves, right, that, that we're on the right track, but that's not, that's still missing the mark. Because you'll notice that if you are on that path, I guarantee you're still hungry. I guarantee you're still hungry. I guarantee your thirst has not been quenched. Even if you think you're doing all the right things, if you think you're working hard, if you think you're a good person, if you think you're X, Y, Z, that you're trying, that you're trying, that you're trying, that you have so much faith in yourself, that you work to be the best you can for yourself, you're still thirsty. And I can say that from experience. And that's because it's not about our disciplines or about our works or about our goodness. It's learning what it means to be holy as God is holy and having an attitude that is pleasing to him. Okay? Because you are, you are a sinful being. You are not worthy and good just because you're here. That's not how that works. Okay? John 1, John, chapter, yeah, words. John 1, verses 8 through 10. <laughs> if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So not only is it idolatry, the self-help, it's also calling God a liar by assuming that we can do it ourselves and that we are infinitely flawless in our flaws. You know, the self-help culture, now I see how contradictory it all really is. It's all so contradictory. It's like, forgive yourself for being imperfect, but you're perfect. It doesn't, again, make sense. But I understand the appeal to it because I was engrossed obsessed with I wanted I wanted my name on the self-help shelf I wanted to write self-help books and help people in that way 
So I understand, okay? Again, this episode is not judging anybody. It's just offering God's truth. It's offering the truth of the gospel. This isn't about me. This isn't about my preference or my opinion. This is what scripture says. And that is what this podcast is about. My last podcast, I've said this before, literally the mission statement of my last podcast was walking each other home on the self-healing journey. So yeah, I know a thing or two about self-help. It was my life. It's what I believed in. It's what I thought was the answer. Just be better. Just do more. Just improve. Just work harder for yourself. Pick yourself up by your bootstraps. You know, do the things. And again, I'm not saying don't, I'm not saying to neglect your well-being. That's not what this means. It's just, you are not perfect, whole and complete. You are not good enough on your own. You are a sinner. You can't do it alone because you were never designed to do that. So the self-help thing is all work on yourself and find yourself. And then here with that verse I just read, you know, you're a sinner. No, don't find yourself. The Bible tells us discover Christ and let him work through you. So it's not about working on yourself and finding yourself. It's about discovering Christ and letting him work through you. And we see that furthermore in Matthew 16, 25, for whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And that's Jesus speaking. So what he's saying there is, if you try to save your own life, you're going to lose your life. But if you lose your life now, meaning you surrender yourself to me, to him, you will have eternity. And you know what? It's not just about the eternity. It's about what you actually get to have here on earth while you're alive in the physical realm. Walking with Christ is a completely different experience in this world than walking on your own. It's a completely different experience. It is black and white. It's literally the difference of being dead or alive. And that's, that's scripture too, because it says that without Christ, we are dead in our sin. And that the new body, the new creation will be resurrected with him. Okay. So again, it's not judgment, that's scripture. And that's God's love for you. God is telling you flat out. Okay. Look, I know that you're, that you're flawed. You're going to come into this life. You're going to have trials and tribulations and sufferings. And there's going to be pains and confusions because this world is broken. But I, I have this for you, right? The Bible. I have this all laid out for you. I sent my one and only begotten son. For I so love the world, God says. So it's, 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 a, it's a showcase of God's love. And I always say that. It's a showcase of God's love. Um, but I'm getting, I'm getting off basis. It says here, Colossians 3.3, 3, For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. You are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So, you know, a lot of, a lot of the books are telling you, how to find yourself step-by-step instructions to find yourself my friend my friend's book that he sent me heal your trauma in 40 days discover your power reclaim your power right but no you are dead and your life is hidden christ in god so don't find yourself discover jesus and he will show you who you are in him okay Next to unpack with these books is the blasphemic dialogue, and right? We've already touched on that. Um, but I'm spe- specifically speaking of the way that these books, messages, practices, whatever, kind of like waters down God or just eliminates him altogether, right? Because a lot of the books treat him as another resource to life. Um, like Luis Hay, you know, he's just, he's, there's a line in, in, in that book that says, 
I am the power that created me. So it's basically saying I am God, right? I, God is with, God is within me. God is me. Or just saying like, you know, having this belief in a higher power gets you through kind of thing. Not gives you the power, but gets you through. So it's like self-help books, when they do talk on God, it's as if God is a supplement. When the truth is God is the supply, okay? God is not a supplement. God is the supplier. So all these books that treat him as just another resource for you, you know, like like the equivalent to money or manifestation. Oh, God, the universe on my side. It's blasphemy. It's straight up blasphemy. Another blasph um, blasphemic kind of avenue is all the I am statements, right? All these books, this whole culture of personal development, this whole movement of self-help, it's all about the affirmations of about stating it to claim it, right? And I was deep with that too, like the I am statements. I am whole, I am wealthy, I am loved, I am beautiful, I am this, I am that. And I remember when I first started reading the Bible, when I first started seeing that I am, and I thought, oh, snap. So that's where that comes from. And now, like, I hear it in movies, too. I forget what movie I just watched recently where he wouldn't even say his name. I want to say it was one of, like, the Avenger movies. He didn't, one of the characters wouldn't say his name. He just said, I am. And I was like, oh no, <laughs> no, you ain't. You know, it's just, but that, but that language is everywhere. Like the blasphemy is saturated in our culture, in our movies, in our music, in our TV shows. And that's an entirely different can of worms, but it coincides with this because it's all hand in hand, because it's just, it's, the self-help culture is just a subculture of the larger progressive move away from the Bible culture, which is the devil's plan, which is setting the world up for the Antichrist. I mean, that's what it is. Satan knows he's running out of time, so he's doing cartwheels, gathering what he can while he can. That's really what it is. So it is all connected. Now, I want to be specific. The seven I am statements of Jesus specifically that I wrote down, he says, John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. John 8, 12, I am the light of the world, right? So a lot of these, a lot of these self-help books talk about light workers. No, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. John 10, 9, I am the door. John 10, 11, I am the good shepherd. John eleven twenty five, 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 15, 1, I am the true vine, okay? So now think back to all those affirmations that whatever influencer or self-proclaimed guru or manifestation coach had you practicing or whatever book you read had you practicing. Think back to those affirmations and how they all started with I am and how you were essentially in that moment proclaiming yourself to be God. So utter blasphemy. And, you know, with all of this, um, everything that I've discussed and, you know, the blasphemy stuff, whether or not that's there, whether or not they even talk about God, you know, as as a supplemental resource to help you through life, or if they talk about the higher self and how you are God, um, or if they just neglect the concept of God altogether and it's just more, you know, straight up, like, wake up earlier, you know, work harder, go to bed on time kind of thing. No matter what umbrella it falls under, it's all self-actualization. That is what self-help is all about. It's self-actualization to be ultimately the flourishing, thriving self, right? So biblical human flourishment comes from the abiding self, not from the actualized self, 
and I'll say that again, biblical human flourishment comes from the abiding self, not from the actualized self. So everyone's out here trying to be self-enlightened and actualized and know the self and blah, 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 blah. But that's not what the Bible calls forward in us. And again, it's why we continue to be hungry because we are just feeding from our own flesh. That was a weird thing to say, but you know what I mean. It's <laughs> self-help is cannibalism. Yay. Um, so basically, right, the self-help idea of the flourishing self or the thriving self is you're constructing that version of yourself. There is always a version of yourself to obtain or to align with whatever. You're, you're in construction of it. And I used to say all the time on my old podcast, you're forever a work in progress. And you know, that's true, but you're not your own work in progress. You're God's work in progress for eternity. Um, but with scripture, it's not the construct of the flourishing self. It's you can literally do nothing without Jesus. Like you're not constructing anything. He's doing it. John 15, 4. Abide in me. This is Jesus speaking. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can you except abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. So Jesus is saying in a really beautiful way here that the branch cannot bear fruit without its vine. And he's saying, you're just a branch. Without, without me, without your vine, you are nothing. That branch snaps on the vine. It's not bearing any fruit. It's not bearing any fruit. So you can literally do nothing without Jesus. And he loves you so much. And he is waiting with arms wide open for you to run right into. To just lay down all this self-help crap and just run to him. Ask him for help. Because he is the vine. He is the vine. Okay? And look, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be better. All right? Like I said at the beginning, that is a hunger that is within all of us. It's innate within all of us, this thirst. It's natural. We all have that craving in our hearts because he put it there. But it's for him. It's not for ourselves. We just get confused because this culture is set up to confuse us. The society is set up to confuse us and to lead us away from God. The devil takes what God has and imitates it. God infiltrates, I'm sorry, Satan infiltrates and imitates everything that God does. So the self-help culture, culture seems like the answer. It seems like the secret of life. And that's because Satan has taken scripture and flipped it on its head and said, no, actually, you are the way, the truth, and the light. It is your birthright because you are worthy. You are your savior. You are your grace. You are forgiven by your own accord. So Satan takes God's word and flips it and then sells it and capitalizes on people's trauma, people's pain, people's confusion and lack of knowing better. And it creates that formula. Self plus self equals more self. So you need more of it once you get into it. It's like, an, it's another spiritual narcotic, self-help. You get addicted to trying to do better because the thing is, it's never going to be good enough. It's never going to be good enough. It's never going to be complete. That motivation to glorify yourself will never fulfill you because there's always something else that's a little bit out of reach. And you know, that's something that I personally, before I was saved for years that I struggled with, 
when I was even immersed with the self-help books and loving it and all this, I would think to myself how sometimes it just seemed really, really backwards. It just didn't make sense to me how people would say in these books like, oh, you can let go, you can heal your trauma, you can heal this, you can heal that all by your own accord. And, you know, you have all this power within you. But at the same time, it was telling me to let go of everything and detach. It was always this contradictory message that I couldn't grasp and I never understood fully. And now I know why. It's because it's not logical and it's not truth. Oh, let go, detach, but also claim your power at the same time. What? <laughs> And then Jesus is so simple. He says, quite simply, uh, branch can't produce fruit without the vine. And I'm the vine. Oh, that makes sense. That actually makes sense. Okay. So bottom line is we cannot be both the problem and the solution because we are meant to draw to Christ. Okay. Okay. Louise Hay, on page 36 of that book, You Can Heal Your Life, says, you know, if we, if we want a joyous life, we must think joyous thoughts. If we want a prosperous life, we must think prosperous thoughts. If we want a loving life, we must think loving thoughts. Whatever we send out mentally or verbally will come back to us in like form. So here she's saying that, you know, all you got to do is change your thoughts. And that's something else that always just didn't make sense to me like oh just change your thoughts okay great again it's you you can if my thoughts are the problem how can just changing them be the solution if my thoughts are the problem doesn't make sense contradicts itself right so no that's not scriptural actually just change your thoughts just change your thoughts just change your thoughts god tells us to repent actually <laughs> It's not about changing your thoughts or changing your mind. It's about repenting for your sins. The thoughts that you have, repent for them. Don't change them. Repent for them. And God will renew your mind and give you a new spirit. It tells us that in Ezekiel. That he will put a new spirit in you. Remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Right? Further, James 4, 8, draw nigh, so near, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So double-minded means you can, basically you confused being, you confused person, you flawed person, you human person, you're just a human you're not good enough. So draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners. Purify your hearts. You're double-minded. How do you do that? By drawing near to God. Because then what happens? He will draw near to you. So then we have Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So how do you be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Not by changing your thoughts, as Louise Hay says. You do that by proving what is good and acceptable and perfect in the will of God. So that brings us to our motivation, okay? Because like I said, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be better. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be better. That craving is put in our hearts for a reason. It's there within us. It's in all of us, right? But is it for your glory or is it for God's glory? And that's an important question to ask yourself when you're, you know, begging the inquiry of how can I be better? How can I do better? Is the motivation your own glory or is it for God? Because self-help leaves you so full of yourself that you don't even realize that you are hungry for God. Self-help leaves you so full of yourself that you don't even realize that you are hungry for God. Therefore, the self-help culture leaves no room for his glory. 
There's no room for God to get any of the glory when we are taking these strides to do better, to be better, whatever the case may be, because the self-help culture, that self plus self equals more self. It's that enoughness mindset. It's my own power within so I can self-actualize. But again, leaves you so full of yourself that you don't even realize you're hungry for God. And so you just keep feeding off all of these things that ultimately are not of the vine, which is Jesus Christ. So we can want to take better care of ourselves, you know, with our family, our body, our monies, our relationships, our health. That's all natural and normal and well and good, right? But what is the motivation behind it? Is it God's glory or is it to exalt yourself? Peter heard from Jesus' ears and he says in 1 Peter 5, 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. So again, it's not about exalting the self. It's about humbling the self before the Lord's feet and letting him exalt you as he will because he is the vine and you are the branch. He produces the fruit from that pl- from that place. So is your motivation to take better care of your family, your business, your health, whatever, is it to exalt yourself, to exalt your life, your sense of purpose, your legacy, whatever, your clout, Or is it to exalt God? A couple examples of that, right? Let's use the body as an example. I want to get fit, feel good, you know, eat well, whatever. That can come from two motivating spots. It can come from the self-help, which is I want to look my best and be the hottest and be the most fit. And post these hot pictures online and let everyone know that I am the best because I have this discipline. I have this grit with my workouts, blah, 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 blah. On the flip side, your body is not your own. This is the scriptural lens, right? Your body is not your own. Your body is a temple. Your body is God. So you want to take care of it for that reason, right? So we can do that with anything. We can do that with money. Do you want a lot of money because money is your security? Okay, is money your security? Or do you pray and work for money because God is your security and he provides that income for you? Now, obviously, you can't just sit on your butt all day and not work, but you know what I'm saying. It's Not seeing money as the security, but knowing that God is the security and that because of that, the money will come. So that's why you work hard for it because God will reward you with that for having the faith in him and for exalting him, not the money because money is idolatry as well, right? Um, How else can we use that? Relationships, okay? Maybe you're into self-help about relationships. Through the self-help lens, it's how can I be fulfilled? How can a partner fulfill me? Me, 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 me. My sex life, my this, my that, my needs, my emotional trauma, blah, 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 blah. Carry this for me, carry that for me, do this for me, do that for me, right? And no. Now, you know, how can I have a relationship that exalts God? You know, what things should I be searching for in a partner that's going to bring out Christ in both them and in myself and together. You know, how can we walk alongside Jesus together? So there are so many different ways with the self-help kind of little umbrellas or subcategories, if you will, pardon me. There's so many things with the self-help subcategories that you can easily turn on its head from self-help to the biblical lens. So the thing with that is, okay, well, what's the opposite of self-help then? Is the opposite of self-love then self-hate? Because it sounds like you're saying, well, we shouldn't work on ourselves, blah, 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 blah. And again, I'm not saying that at all. The thing is, self-love and self-hate are ultimately one and the same. Self-help, self-love, self-hate, self-loathing, It's all one in the same because it's the same focus. It's the same root. It is the self, okay? It is the self. 
So the opposite of self-help is not self-hate. It's self-sacrifice. Okay? Self-sacrifice. Because Jesus tells us, John 3.30, John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. So you must decrease, okay? You must decrease. Self-help. The opposite of self-help is not self-hate. It is self-sacrifice. Luke 9.23, Jesus speaking says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So the opposite of self-help is not self-hate. It is self-sacrifice. Self-love, self-hate, self-help, all the same root. It's the self. All of this, self-sacrifice, it's through the scriptural lens. It's all for Jesus. It's all for God, God's glory, okay? And, you know, we get into this self-help stuff with good intentions. Like, we want to do better. We want to grow. We want to be happy, etc. But over time, that morphs into self-idolatry and can lead into blasphemy, can lead into the New Age practices, and just further find you straying away from God, straying away from God and closer to yourself, closer to the world, and therefore closer to Satan, And that is the danger of it. So it's about self-sacrifice, not self-help. And, you know, that's not pleasing to the ear, okay? You're not going to find 30,000 copies on a shelf of a book that talks about self-sacrifice and giving yourself to the Lord because that's not pleasing to the ear. It doesn't tickle the ear to hear, lay down your life before the Lord's feet. It tickles the ear to hear, you can heal your life manifest your own power, you know, tap into the higher self because that strokes the ego. But God is not interested in stroking your ego. In fact, he calls you to be humble. Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than himself. So he's saying here, you know, It's not about you. It's just not. It's not about you. It's all about self-sacrifice. And again, that is not an easy pill for the self-righteous mind to swallow, to lay down your life before the Lord's feet and follow him. And for your motivation to do better, to be better, actually come from your hunger for God, not to be so full of yourself, right? Leaving room for him to have all the glory, And allowing yourself to decrease so that he may increase. That's not pleasing to the ear. Which is why self-help culture is huge. That's why it's huge. And now you'll say, okay, so what about the whole notion of can't pour from an empty cup? How can I be a steward of the Lord? How can I do unto others if I'm not doing for myself? That doesn't make sense to me. Well, The thing is that whole like notion of can't pour from an empty cup, it's really a false virtue signal um, translating to me first, okay? And that contrasts gospel with that verse that I just read, right? That's all about seeking the least for yourself, seeking the least, esteeming others better than you, and God as greater than all, okay? So yes, do good. By all means, do good. And take care of yourself, but that motivation, let it come from exalting the Lord, not from exalting the self, not from inflating your ego, not from making your life better. How can you make the kingdom better? Start asking that question. How can you glorify the kingdom rather than glorify your flawed, fecal life on earth? So understand that he is your strength, okay? Pray, have a relationship with Jesus, learn the word, okay? We buy all these self-help books. I have hundreds of thousands of dollars, not hundreds of thousands of dollars, but thousands of dollars that I've spent probably on self-help books over the years. And the truth is, this is the only book, the Bible is the only book 
that I needed all along. We always say, I wish I had an instruction manual for life. I I'm holding it right now. This is the instruction manual for life. It's just, it really is that simple. And we just like to complicate it as humans. So we buy 50,000 different books and take that to be our quote unquote truth. And we keep trying, we keep, we keep trying and trying and trying, but that's, we're on a hamster wheel. Self-help culture is ultimately a hamster wheel with no means to an end. Because again, self plus self equals more self. So you can't both be starving and full at once. So you cannot be both the problem and the solution for yourself. That craving you feel, that outside, that yearning to do better, to be better, that is God trying to reach you because he is the vine, you are the branch, together you bear the fruit because you are attached to him, because you are in him. It's not about constructing yourself or constructing your life. It's about finding God as he found you and letting him work through your life in that way. So your practices will always fall short without him. You are hungry because you need God to feed you your daily bread. Not because you need to stand in front of a mirror and do affirmations every morning for 20 minutes. Okay? You are hungry because you need God to feed you your daily bread. So do your things, right? Do all the things like wake up early and go to the gym and eat well and work hard and save your money, but do it with an attitude that is pleasing to the Lord by decreasing the self, not making it all about you, but about the kingdom, about your loved ones, about being Christ-like. Hebrews 12, 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to Jesus because he is the author and the finisher. There is no life by design, okay? Because if you keep trying that way, if you keep going down that road, you're going to just realize the hamster wheel you're on ultimately, Whereas if you pick up your cross and follow Jesus, that narrow path will lead you to eternity. But the hamster wheel you're on of self-help, it's only going to perpetuate more of what you're getting. Which is, you know, stuff that may work for a while, might feel good for a while, but ultimately, it's not coming from the vine, it's coming from you. And so that's going to run out. You are not the living water. Christ is. And so if you keep just drinking from your own well, you're going to continue to be thirsty. Your thirst will never be quenched without knowing Christ. Isaiah 41.10, God speaking to Abraham says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So that being said, Look, I know that there's reasons to seek out self-help. I know that we have troubles. I know that we have trauma and pain and suffering in this world, okay? And again, like I said at the beginning, I'm not saying you shouldn't look for therapy if you feel like you need it. You know, God, God made therapists to be brilliant and to have the resources and knowledge to help people navigate through their pain and their trauma. But it really shouldn't be done without God because nothing can be. Nothing can be done without him. And so, like I said, I know there are reasons to seek out these self-help resources and that this yearning is within you to feel better and do better and be better, but fear not for he is with you. Be not dismayed for he is your God. He will strengthen you. He will help you and he will uphold you with his righteous hand. He's got you. He created the universe with the stroke of his hand. You don't think that he can hold your pain in his. You don't think that he can help you through whatever it is that you're digging into these self-help books looking for. Self-sacrifice, not self-help. Self-surrender. Surrender to Jesus. Surrender your life to him. 
Don't be dead in your sin. All the work to be a good person, to have the good karma, to have the good life. It's nothing without Jesus. Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. He passeth all understanding. These books, these self-help books, these authors, these self-proclaimed gurus and fix your life in 40 days people, their understanding does not come even a fraction close to what God's understanding does. So ask him for your help. Stop looking within. Stop looking to these authors. It's not within. If it were within, you would have figured it out by now. If it were within, you would have figured it out by now. You need Jesus. We all need Jesus. Okay? So seek scriptural self-help if that's a thing. If there are self-help books that are scripture-based, go read those. Sounds good to me. Um, like I said at the beginning, if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast. Five-star rating, written review on whichever platform you listen to or watch. Please follow me on Instagram. I post a lot of content on there. And I'll see you in again in another couple weeks for the next episode. It will be a guest interview once again. So let's close out in prayer. Please bow your head and close your eyes. Unless you're driving, just <laughs> repeat this quietly in your heart. <sighs> Lord, Heavenly Father, may this episode bless those who are listening. May you draw close to them and show all the listeners, that you are the way, the truth, and the life, Lord. Help them in their lives with whatever it is that they are struggling with, with whatever it is that is hurting their hearts, Lord. Draw near to the brokenhearted. Nurture their minds, nurture their souls, nurture their spirits. As an offering, we collectively lay down all the programming from the self-help culture. We lay it at your feet, Lord, and we ask you to replenish our minds, to regenerate our hearts, and to give us new spirits that abide in you, Lord, that do not seek to be self-actualized, but seek to be abided in your will, Lord Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your clarity. Thank you for being the same today, yesterday, and forever, Lord. Thank you for your grace and for your forgiveness of our sins. Thank you for loving us, despite that we are not enough, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you for your unconditional love and your righteousness and your grace and your mercy. And how good you are, Lord. Thank you for how good you are. May this episode and the messages that have been shared land on fertile soil and allow the seeds to be planted and bloom within the listeners. Help strengthen them in the way that they spread gospel and speak on your word. Help them be confident and convicted in your scripture, in your will, Jesus, and not be distracted by anything of the outside world or tempted by anything of the outside world to lead them astray from you with all the shiny bells and whistles that are around us telling us that we can do better and be better, Lord. Continue to show us that we are nothing without you and bless our lives in whatever way brings the most glory to your will. Amen. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'll talk to you next time. Sending you love. God bless you. Praise be unto him.